So today, the shirt is going to be just a little bit see-through. Just is what it is. It's a green shirt. I'm not going upstairs to change it. We're just going to have to live with these kinds of things sometimes, uh, especially being a Green Bay Packers team. Green shirts that are see-through, it's just a thing. So that's just what it is. Um, but today we're looking at training camp day five and also some really, really good notes from the defensive coordinators, position coaches, etc., etc. There's only one defensive coordinator, but you know what I mean. We're going to look at all that stuff, so buckle up. It's going to be a good one. So first off, I want to start off with some general news and notes. Uh, the Green Bay Packers are, are actually practicing in Lambeau Field, um, which, as we'll find out later on, has some extra added benefits, kind of self-explanatory in a way. Um, they were back in pads today. Um, they were pumping noise in. I don't know what in the world you would call that noise, but they were pumping some kind of a noise in. General updates as far as injuries. Um, Devontae Adams and Zedaria Smith are back, but no helmets on. They're just kind of on the sideline doing some work. Adrian Amos and Montrevious Adams not present. Montrevious, remember, had that injury and was taken off the field. Adrian Amos, we found out later, um, was attending a funeral, I believe, for his grandmother. Um, pup list still, some other people that are not currently there, uh, Bolton, Roberts, uh, Nijman, Stepaniak, and uh, uh, Patrick Taylor. Um, and then Corey Lindsley was also not seen at practice, but he came back out later and started doing some work. Not exactly sure exactly what the deal is there. He was out Monday for precautionary reasons, so it's probably similar to what we're seeing with some of these other uh, starting guys to where a lot of precautionary type stuff. Um, what else do we have in general news and notes here? Um, there were some injuries during um, practice, David Bakhtiari as well as Rick Wagner. Bakhtiari seems like it wasn't a big deal. He didn't even talk to trainers, but he kind of just took himself out for whatever reason. Again, very, very precautionary type stuff. They're wanting to make sure that even if you have little dings, just get off the field. Wagner, on the other hand, um, he was looked at. Sounds like a left arm injury. Presumably he's okay, but I don't know if we've had any significant updates. Um, and more than likely, if there's anything even slightly lingering, he's probably going to be doing that whole dance where maybe he's just not playing very much because why risk it? Uh, practice was for a little under two hours. Um, uh, injury update from Lafleur saying Zadarius and Devontae are nothing serious. They've already kind of said that, but reiterating, not a big deal. Um, one of the other things I wanted to point out is that after the hour and 54 minutes, after the initial practice is over, the veterans are excused, but the young guys are told to stay behind. And uh, an interesting quote from Dylan, or I'll just read the tweet. It says, Dylan said the additional time that Lafleur has been reserving for less experienced players has allowed him to, quote, run through something I wasn't so sure earlier and, quote, eliminate the guessing yourself. So it's been really beneficial for guys, um, you know, during the regular um during the regular practice it's just it's assumed that you know because you can't treat everybody like they're stupid because 90 percent of the guys like aaron Rodgers and Devonte and all these guys that are out there they don't need to be baby like we just need to get going we need to get going but some of these guys they're just kind of they're swimming out there they don't know exactly what they're doing so it's a good opportunity to get them in and say look here's what we did what did you guys think or you know what were some of the issues you had and it's like look we did this thing why did you know whatever so I, I really like that, and I hope that they continue doing that because it's not just a COVID thing where we're trying to get guys caught up. That just makes sense in general. So hopefully in years forward that continues. Um, Brian Gutekunst did come out and say that it was his decision to limit the reporting. That's one of the things that uh, I mentioned in the last video. It's been a big scandal. Um, essentially, he just said, look, it, it gives us a competitive advantage pretty straightforward right I mean if, if we don't let other teams see what we're doing then they don't know what we're doing and um, he later went on to say that he does they do look at information from other reporters which a lot of our Packers reporters said that was sort of like aha gotcha but it's isn't that implied like <laughs> the reason it gives us a competitive advantage is because we know scouts and GMs and whatnot use reporters information so that was implied teams do that and Brian Gutekunst, for that reason, is saying, you guys are not going to be doing that. You're not going to be giving away our secrets. And again, I can see both sides of the argument, but how can you be mad at Brian Gutekunst for saying it hurts our team winning football games if you're telling the Vikings and the Bears and everybody else what we're doing? That's bad for us. You are telling them our secrets, and that's a problem, and I'm going to tell you to stop doing that. I want the information. It's fun and it's entertainment. But again, as a GM of a team, I don't see not making that call. 
and they've already said, look, we're, we're not going to do this going forward once fans are back in the stands. Well, duh, because you can't, right? You can stifle the media all you want, but fans are still going to be out tweeting it out. And that's, I mean, that, that would create a pretty interesting dynamic to where you've got the credentialed media are the only ones not allowed to give that. And, and there are certain people that are not credentialed media that would uh, really benefit from from not having those credentials. You might even see some guys turning them in, like like uh, uh, Herman or something. I doubt he would because it's kind of a, a big honor, but he kind of just stepped over, and um, you'd like to have that. But again, they won't because it doesn't make any sense. Why would you stifle the media when the information is going to get out? Um, so those are sort of the general notes. We'll go through some of the uh, more position by position stuff quarterbacks not a ton you'll see a couple notes as we go through wide receivers and whatnot because obviously if they catch something somebody threw it to them um but things that stood out um aaron Rodgers, first of all is very very frustrated not good to see but apparently things just aren't really in sync and he's really getting upset um for example a couple notes here rogers has not been happy with the play of the offense today can't connect with lazard after it looked like he may have stopped on a uh, route um, number one stall on the first two minute drive rogers missed lazard down the middle on fourth and five and appeared angry with him for some reason so it's not good to see we, we've been seeing some issues with um some of the problems we had last year for example this kind of stuff seems to be an issue another issue we had last year was run defense the running game is just kind of trampling all over them. So we could look at it at a, on a positive side with that and say, well, you know, just our run game is, is really on point. But the point is when we when we highlight some of the issues that we hope would be better this year, not a ton of, of great news with that. The other interesting note about Aaron Rodgers, he's not currently wearing the wristband. So um, they're going to try it without that. And so far they're, they've been able to do it. Um, Jordan Love, little of this, little of that. Uh, first note on Jordan Love is that he fumbled a snap in the 11 on 11s. Again, just kind of working through some of this stuff. Um, another note, Jordan Love can move in the pocket. And then Jordan Love's best series of practice as he was able to guide the offense down the field for a field goal attempt, which was drilled by Crosby, a great building block by the young quarterback with a major assist from Darius Shepard. And we'll get into some Darius Shepard notes, notes, notes next, but that's all for quarterbacks. As for running backs, um, Aaron Jones, the, the only real – they did do a lot of pass pro, so we get a little bit of that, but uh, the only note for Aaron Jones, two really strong reps in the pass pro drill. I think that's one of the underrated attributes about Aaron Jones. We hear a lot about how Jamal is really, really good in pass protection. Aaron Jones is is up there with him. Um, we also hear about Jamal being a really good receiver, Aaron Jones. I mean, they're Aaron Jones and Jamal are very similar in those two attributes. The only big difference is Aaron Jones is a infinitely better runner. Um but yeah, Aaron Jones is just phenomenal. A.J. Dillon, on the other hand, really struggled with pass pro. It's not uncommon for a young guy. It's it's a very technical type of thing that he's got to work through. But it's important. If he's going to see the field, this is something he has to get hammered out. So it's not insignificant, but it is expected. Um, first note, A.J. Dillon absolutely whiffs in pass pro against Kamal Martin. Next note, another bad rep from Dillon against Martin. Um, next note after that, not necessarily related, but toss to A.J. Dillon, but absolutely nothing doing. A.J. Dillon runs really low to the ground with great balance. Now, this is my favorite note. Let me finish it. Good luck tackling him, period, much less when it's 20 below zero at Lambeau. Very good point. If you go back and watch, and I would encourage you to, go look at my videos, find the A.J. Dillon video. Um, my biggest negative on A.J. Dillon is that he does not run low to the ground. He does not actually run with a lot of power. He's built for power. But the power is only going to come through as long as you're playing with good pad level. If you're running shoulders back, chest out, you're not going to generate any power. I don't care if you're 250 pounds or 190 pounds. You cannot run straight up in the air at people. And again, I'll show lots of that. But there is one clip in that video of him getting ridiculously low. I'm talking there is a linebacker at almost knee level, like thigh level. A.J. Dillon goes under him, scoops him up, drives him up and back. So he has that ability. It's just a matter of he needs to get that programmed into his head to do that more consistently. But it's great to see a note here that says A.J. Dillon runs really low to the ground because that's something I stashed away in my head. Is he gonna? Are they going to work on his pad level? Sounds like they are, according to this note anyways. He's doing a great job of keeping low. And if he can run low, the, 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 the power is just going to be absurd. Um, Next note, fantastic throw down the uh, right seam from Boyle to Dylan, who held on despite a decent pop from the safety. Um, 
it's that's you know obviously a pretty good Boyle note, but I'm going to put that in with Dylan because he's going to be a starter and Boyle isn't. And then final note for AJ Dylan says he catches up with Jordan Love every day. Their relationship before coming to Green Bay, both being from the same agency, certainly helped. So they've worked together before. They're still working together, which is good for young guys, especially when you're trying to get the offense down because you're learning similar things. So uh, to have the opportunity afterward to kind of catch up and work on that kind of stuff. Uh, a couple notes on Jamal Williams. Nifty run by Jamal inside for about five. Final play featured great blitz pickup from Williams, which is what you expect. He was one of the better pass blockers in the game. Um, talk kind of flippantly about Jamal Williams in terms of there's no real place for him and all that but some of the stuff that he does is hard to replace so it's not going to be an easy decision if they do decide to move on from him and I understand if we do decide to extend Aaron Jones which the word is they're planning on contract talks or are they working on currently contract talks and if that happens I don't know how you also pay Jamal but again the stuff that he does is is um it's going to be tough to replace. He's a very talented guy. Then finally, Tyler Irvin, who's had great notes every single day. Uh, first note, what a route as Irvin turns up uh, around Sullivan. Next one, nice blocking on a run by Tyler Irvin to the outside. So uh, kind of an offensive line note. But again, it's it shows the 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 breadth of, of his talent, not only in terms of as a great receiver, but with that speed, being able to run some outside zone type stuff, which is obviously what the Packers are going to be doing a lot of, and to beat, you know, speed-wise around the edge. Um, final note, Tyler Irvin finds some space and hauls in a pass for a nice gain. Packers dropped into zone. I'll add in John Lovett, the, uh, the fullback here, kind of a running back. Boyle just went deep to Lovett for a big completion. Outstanding leaping grab from Lovett. There was some controversy on that. Sounds like it might have been a push-off, but he's also been getting some pretty positive press and would be another fun piece. Again, there's there's a lot of overlap, right? You've got Sternberger, which kind of covers a spectrum from from blocking tight end to slot wide receiver. And then you got Deguara, which kind of shifts from, you know, probably a little bit of slot, mostly inline tight end, and a little bit of H-back, maybe it's kind of fullbacky. Then you've got a fullback that is, you know, a fullback slash probably H-back a little bit. So there's that full kind of spectrum of, of overlapping if John Lovett makes the team. And I do think they're going to want to have a fullback, although you also have A.J. Dillon, which is going to be a running back. But in two running back sets, A.J. Dillon is actually a very, very good run blocker when you look at his stats from college and whatnot. His, you know, his PFF grades is not much else to go on based on anything uh, film and PFF grades but he did a very good job with that so you're going to see probably some run blocking from him some lead blocking uh, when you do two running backs with Aaron Jones which is going to be exciting so again it, there's there's that spectrum with each one kind of overlapping the other um, but that's it for running backs we'll take a look at wide receiver now so um, ripping through quite a few of these, um, again, nothing really with Devontae with him being sidelined, but Alan Lazard has clearly stepped into that, that number two role. MVS is kind of in and out, right? Some days you look at him and go, I don't know, man, he's really challenging for it. And then days like uh, not this episode, but the last one, he was kind of struggling. So um, kind of balances out. But Lazard has been consistently dominant. couple notes on him. We're seeing one-on-one -on -one receiver and corner drills, and Lazard just beat Alexander on a back shoulder for a catch from 12 awesome for a couple reasons. Alexander's our number one corner who he just beat. Um, back shoulder kind of denotes timing and whatnot. Um, it's also a, a pretty difficult catch, so uh, really solid play there. And then the, the very next one, Lazard, up and over Alexander, who has a great contest. Normally that would be a pass breakup, but Lazard has some seriously strong hands. Several notes on that on Twitter. Basically, everybody was shocked and had no idea how he came down with that. There's no video, but it sounds like it's an incredible... Um, catch for him which is really strong hands um so again Lazard has just got some we know he's got some some certain skill sets that are impressive and a lot of people really liked him coming out of college but um there's always been a big question mark with him being undrafted he didn't play a ton last year as much as it seemed like he did his snap count was relatively low so there's some question about is he going to be able to maintain that throughout this year and, and play at that level but if training camp is any indication he's he's just the the lock number two MVS had another really good day, though. Again, he's been up and down. This was, a, this was an up day. First note, MVS with an incredible diving catch on a throw from Rodgers that was a bit wide. That's how you were in trust. MVS having a great day. Next note, MVS, another catch from Rodgers on a crosser. 
Rodgers to MVS again, wash, rinse, repeat, big day for third-year wide receiver. And then finally, um, again, we've had quite a few interviews, mostly defense, but a couple with uh, Gutekunst and whatnot. Uh, the note says, asked about Packers wide receiving core, Gutekunst singles out, Mar- singles out Marquez Valdez. Scout, <laughs> one of those days. I got through two of his names. Marquez Valdez Scantling for having a really great uh, practice. Um, Equinemius, who's been fairly consistent in terms of being a, a pretty good wide receiver, a couple bad notes here and there, not as many notes as MVS, but again, he's been pretty solid for the most part. Um, first note on EQ, EQ beats Josh Jackson, and then the second one says, Love forced from the pocket, didn't have time to set, throws a pass from the left sideline, looked destined to be incomplete, but for a great effort to stretch out and grab it from Equinemius. So um, kind of just a bad ball that was lobbed out there. Equinemius is able to make somewhat of a circus catch to come down with it. Um, only note on, on Kumro is kind of a bad one. Kevin King completely owned Jay Kumro up the left sideline. I've got a lot of really good Kevin King notes, but I wanted to at least put that one in there because Kumro has not done a lot to impress. He's got a couple out there, you know, um, but the real unfortunate thing is this is usually when Kumaro shines, right? This is the time when Kumaro looks like a number one wide receiver. This is the reason everybody gets excited about Kumaro. The fact that he's behind Lazard, MVS, EQ, even maybe Reggie Begleton and a few other guys in training camp does not speak well about his ability because, again, this is when he shines, and then it's the regular season where he just kind of seems kind of iffy. A um, couple notes on Reggie Begleton. Number one, absolutely beautiful last step separation by Reggie Begleton against KB on Ento. That was really, really pretty perfect perfectly executed route and catch. Next note, Begleton has put together a couple really good reps as a gunner as well, which is kind of important. It seems seems not important, but um, he, and as well as Malik Turner, there's one note on him is that he looks good as a, as a gunner as well. If you think about Jeff Janis, he was, to be polite, a subpar wide receiver. Had a couple decent catches and whatnot. Obviously, the Hail Mary was, was a big one. But... Um, now, now I'm stuck on that play. Was that a Hail Mary? Anyways, the the reason he was on the team as long as he was, he was an absolute ace on special teams. My, my brain gets locked up on stuff like that, trying to remember that play. But um, that was what helped him do. And obviously Trevor Davis is another one, not as a gunner, as a returner. But, but that could be, especially when we talk about, okay, so we know MVS is going to be a guy. We're pretty sure... Uh, or excuse me, we know Lazard, we're pretty sure MVS, EQ's got a really good shot of, of being one of the top guys. Who's after that? If you can stand out, as Reggie Begleton did in training camp, as well as show that, you know what, I can be somebody on special teams, right? If you're number four, five, six as, at wide receiver, special teams is massive, right? If, you, if you're really solid as a number two, it doesn't matter, right? It just, we're not going to put you out there. Devontae will never be on special teams. He's way too valuable as a wide receiver, but making the depth chart beyond that special teams is pretty important. And then Darius Shepard had a really solid day. I mentioned that that drive from um, Jordan Love, Darius Shepard really bailed him out quite a bit. It's kind of an unfair way to say it, but it sounds like that was the case. But the full notes on him, Shepard runs a great route to beat Sullivan with sudden separation at the top of the route. Shepard run, r- runs right past Sullivan. That's a separate note. Darius Shepard has looked good today, just held on to a laser from Jordan Love over the middle after taking a big hit. And then finally, another fantastic catch, this time along the sideline by Shep from Love. Those two are in rhythm right now. So haven't heard a lot from Darius Shepard. We know that he brings some, some juice to the special teams, especially as a returner. So he's got that going for him as well. Again, Kumro kind of getting buried here as Begleton um, and Darius Shepard are kind of standing out as receivers as well as special teams guys and even Malik Turner kind of stepping out, standing out on on special teams. Um, And again, Kumro, I've mentioned this before, when we brought him on, he was already kind of advanced in age. So he's got that working against him. He's got, you know, contracts coming up, which he got guys that aren't looking for contracts yet. So... I'm not trying to predict that Kumaro's gone, but I kind of feel like Kumaro's pretty much gone. Uh, moving on to tight ends, uh, another, just to summarize, another really good day from DeGuara, but overall the tight ends are showing up. Um, Jace, who hasn't really made a ton of, of highlights so far, a couple notes on him. Sternberger open over the middle, but Boyle misses him. Didn't seem to be on the same page there, so obviously, again, his only job is to get open, so solid there. And then finally, Jordan Love finds Jace on a crossing route underneath, over on the sideline, a figure in a red jersey, uh, blah, 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 Aaron Rodgers, hands up in the air, yay. Um, But he beat Burks on that. Now, more on Burks in a little bit, but um, 
you know, a lot of people have been big on Bur It's weird. Some guys, when, we, when they get drafted, the fans just love them. Oren Burks is one of those guys, and I don't really know why. Conversely, Rashawn Gary, much more upside, much more potential, much better rookie season than Bur Burks has ever had, and nobody likes Rashawn Gary. So I don't understand it, but it's not looking great for Burks. But anyways, Josiah DeGuara, who's basically had very positive notes every single week so far. Um, first note, DeGuara, great leaping sideline grab with a toe tap to beat coverage by Raven Green. Second one, Boyle finds DeGuara on an out route. Another crisp day from Boyle and a nice day from DeGuara as well. Mercedes Lewis, he gets back in pads. He's been kind of out and in, and that's going to be kind of normal. I think even if he wasn't uh, dealing with any kind of injuries, they're still going to be limiting him. We saw last year they were doing that thing where he was getting veteran rest, which seemed kind of weird, but it seemed to work out. A lot of our guys, the veteran guys, were getting a lot of time off with practice and whatnot, and uh, it seemed to be to their benefit. But uh, back in pads... Um, and the only real note for him, but still something, Lewis uses his huge body to box out Redmond. That's basically, I mean, that's why we have him, right? That's why you have Mercedes Lewis, to just blow people up. We saw another note, uh, I think, with the last one or whatever, where he blew up Rashawn Gary. Um, and then Tanyan also getting in the mix a little bit. Great job by Tanyan, sealing Burks outside, creating a big lane for Jones on a toss to the left. Again, Burks getting beat. Uh, Tanyan beats Green inside for a nice gain. Tough day for Green today. Um... I'm not going to give Green a hard time like I'm giving Burks a hard time because Raven Green has basically had really good days every day except this day. So we'll see what happens with Raven Green. Um, it'll be real interesting going forward. It seems like Mike Pettin really likes that sort of um, safety linebacker hybrid position. And so whether or not Green is that guy is going to tell us a lot about what the Packers do going forward. It's possible, as much as it seems unlikely, the Packers would be looking at safety. It's possible they they kind of look at a guy like that if Raven Green can't be that guy. But as far as we can tell, Raven Green kind of is. Even if he's not elite top tier, he seems to be good enough to be able to do uh, what, it, what it is he needs to do. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's I was going to move on to the next thing. Let's let's stop and go on to the next one, which is offensive line. Hello again. Um, I don't know if I want to go through. I, I guess, no, I'm not going to. So they've got kind of the breakdowns of who beat who. It's really not that interesting. They, they only got two reps against each person. Yeah, I, I did it on the podcast. If you want to hear it, go check out the Packernet podcast. I broke down every single one of them. Um, not all that. There's, there's one that's interesting, and we're going to talk about that anyways. Um, the only other general offensive line note, um, the cutback lanes for Aaron Jones continue to be huge in team drills. In other words, giant lanes being blown open. Again, we can look at that from a negative perspective and say the defensive line is still not able to get this going, and that's a bad thing. Or we just get jacked up that the offensive line has really got this figured out. Um, Bakhtiari and Wagner, again, no real updates outside of the injuries, which I talked about. Bakhtiari seems fine. Um, we'll see about Wagner. It's possible there's already been an update, and I just missed it. I've been kind of focused on notes from uh, yesterday and, and two days ago. Or, yeah, yesterday and two days ago. But Alex Light, um, some positive news for him. He was getting beat up real bad early on when he was uh, replacing Bakhtiari. But a couple notes. Number one, Alex Light had a really nice day in pass protection so far. Nice to see after his struggles a season ago as well as these last few days. Next note, great pass block by Light on Gary. And then third, Alex Light, who's playing a position on the field. Again, with these, it just it annoys me to no end. He's, whatever. Alex Light, who's playing a position on the field, got sucked inside against Preston Smith. Rashawn Gary, another professional player, rushed outside on a stunt, had a free shot at Aaron Rodgers. So the bottom line is this was his one bad rep. He got kind of confused on a stunt. Rashawn Gary burst to the outside gets around for a sack so that's a plus for Rashawn and a negative for Alex Light but overall it's better that he's at least having more good plays than bad as opposed to before and beyond that you kind of want Rashawn Gary to beat your backup tackle so I'm not super upset by that um just kind of blend all the offensive linemen together because there's not much else Elton Jenkins the only note false start by Elton Jenkins gets pulled right away um there was a note from Packers coach Matt LaFleur said that he believes Billy Turner uh, has proven he can start for them at right tackle if they decide to go that direction. I'm going to stand on my position that that is absolute nonsense. I don't think he can play right guard or right tackle. I mean, he can, just not very well. Um, you know, I mean, th there have been flashes. If you go back and look at what he's done at other places, he's had some success. And I, I, I can't see any difference between his ability at tackle and guard. So I suppose if he's going to play slightly subpar um you'd kind of rather get that production at tackle than guard if you if you have no options at either position which we do wagner's a clearly a better tackle um i'm not just trying to throw shade for, for the sake of throwing shade i just don't get it 
and and you know the fans clearly don't understand it. I mean, he was by far the weakest link along that entire offensive line all year long, and all we hear from the coaches is how much they love him, how great he is. We could put him at tack. We could do whatever we want with him. He's an elite player. Where are we getting this from? Um, and then Lane Taylor, formerly a starting left guard, says it's been an easy transition to right guard. Not that that's an official change, just that they've been playing him there um, in training camp. He feels natural on that side. Quote, I played right side my whole life until I got to Green Bay. So he's another versatile piece. Generally, you can move left to right. Um, a lot of offensive linemen had, have said that it is actually kind of hard to do that as far as learning all that. But um, if they decided to, Lane Taylor is another one of those versatile pieces they can move around. And I do not have any offensive center notes. So we're done with that and moving on to defense in which there is a lot of notes. All right, defense. So the reason there's so many notes isn't necessarily because the defense was so dominant. It's because we had Mike Pettin and we've had Jerry Gray and we had the defensive line coach and the inside linebacker coach and the outside linebacker coach, as well as Sean Menenga, um, special teams coach, do a press conference. So they had a lot of comments. Um, Some general defensive notes before we get into position by position. Number one, uh, Packers defensive coordinator Mike Pettin says he evaluated defense after each season. He tweaked coverage, pass rush, and certainly the run defense defense after last season. He wants Run D to be a blend between gap shooting, disruptive, and assignment sure slash anchoring in gaps. Uh, he says there's a time and place for everything. So I don't know how much we should read into that. As much as we say that that's probably a good thing, it's also bad because part of the benefit is is year two for a lot of these players. There's a lot of rookies, a lot of uh, newer guys. So if you're just building on it that's great if you're changing it then you're kind of starting over at the same time so i'm sure there are minor tweaks and whatnot and for the most part it's all kind of the same but uh just kind of makes me a little bit nervous uh, next note Petten knows tackling quality might be compromised early in the season not just for the packers but for everyone but he wants to avoid risk of live reps quote i think we all know this year is about attrition and who can be the healthiest for the longest and who can be healthiest at the end i think that makes a lot of sense um so the, the point is, a lot of these guys are trying to figure out how do we bring everybody up to speed as fast as possible, so we want to cram as much in as possible, and tackling is a part of that. That's something that even early on in the season, even when we have preseason and, preseason and everything else, the tackling is kind of terrible. It's just one of those things that you really got to drill and, and hammer home. Um, but Pettin's looking at it and saying, look, we're going to be missing tackles. I'm much less concerned about missing tackles and much more concerned about missing players for several weeks. So that, that to me, makes a lot of sense. I think a big part of the 13-win the regular season last year had to do with the fact that we were one of the least injured teams in football. And um, given the amount of injuries there's probably going to be this year because of a lack of practice, it makes sense that we want to just try to keep guys healthy if possible. Uh, Next note, Jerry Gray's mindset on defensive back play, quote, to me, being cautious is not a good sign of a good secondary. He wants his guys to recognize which plays are theirs to be made, but not hesitate when is their time. That last part obviously wasn't part of his quote. Um, And then finally, Packers defensive backs coach Jerry Gray said his new safety have watched film of Viking safety Harrison Smith and Anthony Harris and then had discussed about their approach to making big plays. He wants all his DBs to feel they can make big plays. So that was one of the things I think a lot of the DBs, with the exception of Kevin King, kind of left on the field. Um, There's kind of onesie twosie. Jair missed a bunch of of real big opportunities for interceptions. He's kind of, that's kind of been his big issue. But, um, you know, Jerry Gray obviously is is a very good defensive backs coach. And um, I'm excited to see what he can do for these guys. Uh, We'll just roll into defensive tackle since we're sitting here, I guess. I don't really feel like stopping it. Notes on Kenny Clark. First off, um, with uh, I, I mentioned I wasn't going to do the one-on-ones, but the real solid one-on-one rep that people were excited about was him versus Elton Jenkins. They did two reps of that. Now, it seems as though Kenny Clark won both reps, according to the people that were there, but they said it was very, very close, and um, it, was, it was a really good battle, which is what you want to see. You expect El- Kenny Clark to win, but the fact that Elton Jenkins, who's just going into his second year, second-round pick, is, is kind of, in a sense, holding his own, even though he's losing, that's solid, right? I mean, the, the fact that that's a clash of titans kind of feel to it as opposed to just Kenny Clark just whooped on our starting left guard and it wasn't even close. Um, second note on Kenny Clark, Kenny had a clear shot on Aaron Jones, but wisely let him keep running. Would have been a tackle for a loss in a real game. So, you know, again, smart player. He's not going to just rip down his running back for the sake of, you know, trying to puff himself up or prove anything. He just got paid. He doesn't need to prove anything. He did his job. He won that rep. He knows he won that rep. Don't hurt your own guys. 
Um, then finally, Jerry Montgomery and Kenny Clark's skills both against the run and pass. Quote, when you talk about nose tackle, he's the best two-way nose tackle in the game, meaning, you know, whether it's two gapping uh, at, at, at nose where you're, you're holding down two spots at once, whether you're taking on double teams or whether you're shooting gaps and getting after the quarterback, his ability to kind of play both sides of that. Um, whereas you got some guys that specialize, you know, Snacks Harrison um, or, um, I don't know, Pierce with Minnesota now, guys that are largely just run defenders or guys that are more like, I don't want to say Aaron Donald because he's a two-way guy as well, but some guys that are just gap shooters, right? They can't play the run to save their lives, but they can get after the quarterback. That's what he means by two-way. He does that really, really well. A uh, quote from Jerry Montgomery, who is the defensive line coach on Kingsley Kiki, quote, year two, he's been in the system. It's time to put up or shut up. Um, he does say later on, I see him taking those steps, but I, I love the honesty from Jerry Montgomery on that because Kingsley Kiki, as far as a rookie goes, it's fine, but you don't want him to kind of stay at that level because that's not good enough. That's not going to keep you on this team. You got a solid foundation. Now it's time to step up, especially since it's wide open next to Kenny Clark. I mean, there, there are guys, Dean Lowry and everything else, but he has the opportunity to really step up and be that other guy, to be that top-tier kind of guy. And, and um, the expectation is you need to get there. So it's the final note on the defensive tackles. Uh, moving on to edge rush, uh, Zadarius Smith, again, he's not really playing right now uh, due to injury, but he, he was on the sideline working with a lot of the guys, um, kind of showing them what to do, working with Rashawn and whatnot. Um, the one note outside of that that I saw was from Mike Smith, who got a lot of people fired up. He noted that Zadarius Smith had, quote, one of the best games I've ever seen last year against Carolina. He uh, listed him as having 16 to 17 pressures in that game, but didn't have a single sack. A lot of what he was going on about was um, talking about how sacks are kind of useless and you need to be looking at pressure percentage, which is something that, again, if you listen to the podcast, I've been preaching that for a long time. Um, I actually sort of created that metric myself because PFF doesn't actually have that. But they have total pressures, which is great. But it's like, well, some guys have more uh, snaps than others. So it's, it's very simple. You take the pressures, you divide it by the snaps, and you get pressure percentage. So that's the metric I've always used when looking at this. It's a metric I've always told you about Zadarius. It was 17-something percent. Kenny's a 12 to 13 kind of guy, which is pretty standard for good, not super elite type players. Rashawn was at about 10 and a half, which isn't great, but it's kind of the baseline. Anything under 10, you're kind of trash. So it's good to at least get to that 10. Anyways, that was kind of his whole thing. He was going on about that, which is it's cool that he, he mentioned that because it's absolutely true and people need to stop worrying about sacks, especially with Rashawn Gary. He only had two sacks. First of all, he had three. If you're counting half sacks, you're doing it wrong. Don't count half Half sack is a sack. It's not, you shouldn't be penalized because somebody else also got a sack on that play. That's stupid. Um, what was I talking about? Um, as far as Adarius Smith, PFF actually accredited him with 12 pressures, but um, I've noticed that the Packers give more credit to their guys than Pro Football Focus does. They grade differently. It's fine. It's not a big deal. But um, it, it was tied for his best game pressure-wise with Seattle. So if you want to go back for something to do and look at some Zadarius highlights, Carolina is a very good game. He doesn't have any sacks. But if you want to see an example of a game in which you have zero sacks but have a fantastic game against another team, go check that out. Now, he wasn't very good against the run in that game, but as far as pressures go. Otherwise, Seattle probably was his best game of the year, I would say. So not to disagree with Mike Smith, but if I had to vote, that would be my vote is him against uh, Seattle. Also, Devontae Adams against him. That was his best game of his entire career against Seattle. So it's a good game to go back and watch for a lot of reasons. Preston Smith, who hasn't had a lot of notes to date. Uh, first note, Preston Smith would, uh, had a would-be sack on Aaron Rodgers during 11 and 11s, and Rodgers throws it into the grass. Second note, Preston Smith appears to have a sack, so he had two sacks on the day. Bunch of notes on Rashawn. Uh, number one, Rashawn with a nice pass rush against Rick Wagner. He's showing more burst. Uh, it was one-to-one -one against Rick Wagner. In fact, I think it was the rep against Rashawn in which he hurt his arm. Um, possibly Rashawn did that, or it's just a thing. I don't know. Not not, not blaming Rashawn. I'm just saying it's when it happened. Uh, second note, Rashawn Gary close to a sack. Third note, Gary looks as if he's benefiting from extra strength and a healed shoulder. He's able to use force to get the offensive line off of him and create space. I've seen this a couple different times now. Uh, the, the idea that, he, first of all, his shoulder is better, but he's a lot stronger. And his ability to get off blocks seems to be much more pronounced, I guess, than in the past. So that'll be fun to watch, especially against the run. That's where this really going to come into play. When you lock up and you're kind of just biding your time, 
right? A lot of times it looks like you're blocked, but really you're just kind of holding the guy in place. And then when the running back sort of declares, whether he's going to your outside or he's going to cut inside, you shed him one way or another and make a play. And that's where somebody with his kind of strength and his already pretty talented ability to do that kind of stuff is going to come into play a lot more. And if he can just be, at the very least, kind of maintain that 10 11% pass rush rate, but also really grow as a run defender, that would be a really good, in my opinion, because we have Zadarius and Preston right now, a pretty solid step in year two. Just throwing that out there. Mike Pettin quote on Rashawn Gary. Quote, Rashawn is, is going to have a big role in what we're doing along with Garvin. A couple things on that. Number one, a big role in what we're doing is just something that Mike Pettin says about everybody. So it's very strange. But the fact that he singles out Garvin and saying that Garvin is going to, he's our seventh round pick. He's saying Garvin is going to have a big role in what we're doing. That's kind of a shocking thing i guess just the fact that he's even making the team and as a starter which you know usually drafted guys are but uh to then go on to say he's gonna have a big role um i've kind of just started tuning that out when he says he's gonna have a big role i think it just doesn't mean anything uh next quote mike Pettin on rashawn gary quote how he handled his business when he was not here was tremendous obviously i don't think there's anybody with a better work ethic than rashawn gary one of his many great attributes mike smith on rashawn gary quote he's one of the hardest working guys i've ever seen he's an unbelievable shape he's in ridiculous shape so that's already been talked about i mean he, he just all he does is work that's all he does i mean not to dog guys but we know that some of these guys go home and play video games that's what they do right blake martinez used to do it i can talk about him because he's gone but a lot of other guys currently they go home. guys that are on the bubble guys that are fighting for jobs they go home and they play video games rashawn gary does not stop working he just doesn't. That's all he does. Um, next note, Packers offensive lineman, uh, linebacker coach Mike Smith says Rashawn Gary texted him at 1230 in the morning this morning before, asked for three things he could work on during his off day today. Again, you got guys that are sleeping, guys that are playing games, guys that are just hanging out. Rashawn Gary at 1230 in the morning, probably just getting done with a workout, texts his coach. Probably not a good idea. I wouldn't do that. I'd be thinking he's sleeping. I better leave him alone. Nope. He sends him a text. Hey, I need three things that I can work on. I love Rashawn Gary, man. I just do. Uh, final note, Smith is praising Rashawn Gary. Quote, I do not have a what if for him. He wants, quote, he wants to be good. Quote, the strides he has made is credit to him because he's shown up. Bottom line is, and, and, and remember, or maybe you don't remember, when we drafted Rashawn Gary, there was some question about why Rashawn. A lot of people didn't really like the pick. He flat out told everybody, this guy was number one on my board as far as off the edge. He was, he was number one. I mean, he's the outside linebacker coach. He's looking for an edge guy. He went to Petten and everybody said, that's that's my guy right there. That's the guy I want. So he's going to bat for him. But it's not just because we drafted him. Unless he's just flat out lying, which I guess is possible. But um, he's he's been on the Rashawn Gary bandwagon since day one. And he flat out told us, this is the best pass rusher in college football after we got him. Nobody agreed with it. And, and the fact that Bosa's there kind of makes it seem a little bit ridiculous. Because Bosa, as a rookie, might have been the best edge rusher in all of all of football and i will happily back that up if you'd like me to um he's going to be an absolute he already is but he's going to be just something else but a lot of excitement from our very talented uh very i'll leave it a talented outside linebacker coach mike smith jonathan garvin who apparently made the team uh fights through the line for a pressure which causes Boyle to fire high for sternberger that was probably the one we heard about uh, the sternberger overthrow is because of a pressure from garvin Note on, on uh, from Tim Williams. Tim Williams failed to set the edge on a run, but went for minimal gain, so bad note on him. And then two guys that we haven't heard a lot about up to this point, typical Leia being one of them. It says, in one-on-ones, a guy to watch was undrafted linebacker, typical Leia, very quick off the ball. Downside, he's 6'5", 229, so not a very prototypical Packers guy, but neither is Tyler Irvin. And the, the, the point is, they don't like Tyler Irvin-type guys, but if you show up and you give us that extra dynamic and, and can can do the things that we don't expect you to be able to do, which is why we don't draft guys like you, they'll use them. So that's sort of the challenge for typical Leia at 229. I mean, very few teams. The Titans are the only ones I can think of that have these really tiny outside linebackers. Um, the Packers like really big guys. But again, I mean, 6'5", he's got long arms, which Patton is obsessed with. Um, but if you can just do the job, they'll give you a chance. Second note, typical uh, Tippa bursts through a would-be sack on Love. Third note, really good pass rush rep from uh, Galea in team would have been a sack. So multiple sacks for him. And then lastly, Delonte Scott, another guy we haven't really talked about, but Delonte Scott fires through on a blitz for a sack. 
uh, but Love delivers, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. And then Delonte Scott with another impressive play, bull rushing through John LeGlue for a sack of Love. Now it's third team, but still pretty good for Delonte to be able to, I mean, again, all you can do is win, right? It, it doesn't matter. If, you, if you're Kenny Clark and you're going up against the third team, the best you can do is win. So uh, he did exactly what was asked of him, stood out first time on this list for, I think, both of them. Maybe Galea's made it on here once or twice, but for sure Delonte Scott. But uh, edge rushers, a lot of love, a lot of praise, and um, a lot of pretty solid play. Uh, for linebackers now, some, some pretty interesting notes, um, especially at that number two spot. We'll start off with uh, Matt LaFleur. He says, the young inside linebackers, Ty Summers and Kamal Martin, Martin I'm, I'm fading fast here, are going to have to be ready to play when the season starts because it's still a competition for the spot next to Christian Kirksey. It's interesting the name they left out of that, right? Matt LaFleur is calling out Ty Summers and Kamal Martin because somebody has to step up into that number two spot. Um... Where's Oren Burks in this conversation? <laughs> Again, he has not been very good. That was followed up by a uh, comment by Mike Patton, the defensive coordinator. It was it is a quote open competition at inside linebacker behind opposite or opposite Kirksey. And then third, which is just hilarious because there's so many great comments from so many of these coordinators. And then we get the one comment that people found relevant. Inside linebackers coach Kirk Olvadati on the speed of the group. Quote, I think we've got a fair amount of speed. We've got enough that we can win with. I know that. <laughs> they better be real good this year, man. I'm sorry, but I just, I don't know. Anyways. Uh, more really great news from Christian Kirksey. The guy, every single day, it's just a stack of, of notes. And, and as much as training camp doesn't necessarily mean anything, when you are when you're got this many really good notes, remember, Zadarius was the same way, just beaten up on, on David Bakhtiari. And Christian Kirksey's not only winning, he's winning against guys that we know dominate, you know, Aaron Jones and MVS on crossing routes and, and you know, just a lot of speed and talent and with the number ones and, um, it's to the point now where it would be almost a little surprising if he wasn't, if he didn't exceed my expectations. But uh, a couple of the notes from Thursday from Christian Kirksey. Number one, Kirksey with a really strong rep in one-on-one -on -one passing drill with Aaron Jones, who ran a good route uh, with Kirksey all over him. Number two, like what I've seen from Kirksey in space, anticipates, keeps balance, and can trail. Uh, check down to Jamal Williams, but Kirksey is right there for an immediate stop. Um, another pass to running back, another stop by Christian Kirksey. Anything five yards or less, sideline to sideline, he's been absolutely all over to start camp. Finally, Mike Pettin on Christian Kirksey, quote, Kirko has been great. Stepped in here, leadership role, everyone gravitated to him. He's a good communicator on the field, off the field, take charge kind of guy. It's important to him. He looks good. He's running around well. He's been what we expected. Um, zero notes on Oren Burks outside of the negative notes you've already heard and the fact that apparently the coaches don't even want to consider him for the number two spot. I mean, maybe it's implied, but um, <laughs> yikes. Um, but Kamal Martin is uh, kind of stepping up a little bit. First note, don't know if either of them can cover or tackle, but Kamal Martin and Ty Summers sure seem to be able to cover a lot of ground, which, granted, that's technically a Ty Summers note as well, but the, the only thing Ty Summers can do is move fast, right? That's all we've known out of him. Kamal Martin, the one thing that we don't know about him is whether he can be a sideline to sideline guy. So it's a good note for him. And then finally, former Gophers linebacker Kamal Martin has flashed a bit today, just blew up the final play in 11 on 11. So that's really the only big note we've seen from Martin. But again, you've got a ton of great news from Christian Kirksey and just, just crickets after that. So at least it's something from someone. Um, I've seen nothing positive from Warren Burks. I've seen zero notes on Ty, uh, Ty Summers. So we've got one play blown up by Kamal. I'll take it. Cornerback play, which has been pretty solid all through camp, kind of continues a little bit here. Some up and down, but um, Jair note, Alan Lazard got the better of Alexander in drills, but Jair just blanketed him in the first pass in uh, team. Kevin King, who's been probably the, the better corner in training camp so far. He's got a few notes here. Kevin King defends Kumro well, well, forced him to the left sideline incomplete. Then Rodgers and MVS not on the same page. Great coverage by King. Then finally, King's coverage on Kumaro forces him out of bounds. No chance for Kumaro to make the play. King looks great today. Shannon Sullivan, who is the presumed number three, the, the slot guy, a couple notes on him. 
Amo said yesterday he has, quote, full confidence in Packers cornerback Shannon Sullivan, the likely starter, starter at slot. It's not a guarantee, but the only real competition he had was Josh Jackson. And presumably, as we'll find out, I probably shouldn't skip ahead, but he's being specifically put on the boundary. So Shannon doesn't really have a lot of competition. Uh, Josh Jackson seems to be the clear backup on the boundary, and that's just kind of how this is all laid out. But um, next note for Chandon. Among the reasons Packers have Chandon Sullivan in the slot, Jerry Gray says he likes Chandon Sullivan's run defense from the nickel cornerback spot. Quote, he looks like a safety playing nickel, and a lot of people don't really like to run in his direction. Kind of strange because he's not actually a really big guy. Um, and uh, via PFF, the run defense was the only thing he didn't do well. He graded out as one of the best corners we had on this team, and that's no joke. Um, small sample size, but not that small. Um, but it was mostly coverage, and his tackling is pretty solid, but his run defense wasn't great, and he's not that big. So it's a strange thing. It must just be a, a mentality thing for him. Uh, Gray adds in uh, that he's been using Tremont's tape from 2019 to help Sullivan grow, which makes sense because he's taking that job. A couple notes on Josh Jackson. Mike Pettin on Josh Jackson, quote, he's done a great job, came in here with the right mentality. Uh, Pettin goes on to say he's playing exclusively on the perimeter to start this training camp. We have high expectations for Josh. He's going to be a big part of what we're doing this year. There's that line again. Um, beyond that, Coach Jerry Gray, the defensive backs coach on Josh Jackson, um, he's teaching Josh to use his strength um, but not being overly physical. He says that uh, – the key is to not overly muscle guys. You've got to have a little finesse in your game. So, again, with Josh Jackson, the big thing is he's he's a kind of a bigger, more physical type of cornerback that's used to zone. So now that he's in man, he's got to learn that although physicality is great, especially on the line, at some point it's just about you, you got to run with the guy. You got to you got to play with him. You can get some hand fighting and be you know you want to be physical, but you can't just be grabbing and pushing and you know you're not a linebacker. So that's kind of what he's working on, and that's that's great. That's great that it's it, they're finally identifying. First of all, let's let's zero in on one job for him to do, and let's really get him to hone that craft, which is what is needed to have been happening since forever. And I think I've said that several times. Uh, note on Stanford Samuels, sort of my outside shot guy of. Uh, Making the roster, he's been pretty solid so far. One note for him today, nice pass breakup in the back of the end zone by undrafted free agent rookie cornerback Stanford Samuels from Florida State on a Jordan Love pass intended for Jay Kumro. Jay Kumro just getting worked out there. Um, KB on Ento, a couple notes for him. Ento shoots off a block for a tackle of Mercedes Lewis. Tackle, nice play by KB on. KB on Ento is having a good day today was the second note. So there must have been other stuff that wasn't noted. And then finally, somebody that uh, hasn't really uh, been noted very much, Will Sunderland, says Will Sunderland has the best play of camp for him, obviously. Well, maybe not. Breaking up a pass intended from Malik Taylor. I'm going to go ahead and assume that they meant for him, but I don't know. We can give him that one. He's not going to make the team anyways. <laughs> finally, the last defensive position, safety. Uh, note on Darnell Savage. Not a real big one, but Jerry Gray says, quote, he's ready to take another step. But uh, elaborates on that, says Gray was super impressed with Savage's rookie season. Neither of those are really very big comments. But um, I think it's nice to get confirmation that Gray was, and again, it might just be a throwaway line that he doesn't necessarily believe. But um, Darnell Savage is another one of those guys, kind of similar to Kingsley Kiki, where if you, if you judge it based on, hey, he's a rookie, solid, right? But the fact of the matter is he has to be better. Otherwise, he's just going to be pretty average. So, again, for a rookie, solid start. But he's got way more potential. And with the combination of Savage's upside and Jerry Gray, who's made some of the better safeties in all of football, um, the expectations should be and are clearly much higher than what Savage did. So not trying to knock his rookie season. It was fine, but it, it definitely needs to be better. Um Raven Green, I already mentioned, kind of got beat up on a little bit, but a couple notes. Raven Green ends red zone period with a leaping pass breakup on a deep shot from Love. Mike Pettin on Raven Green, quote, his versatility and explosiveness is something that we've missed. We're looking forward to take advantage of it this year. Goes on to say, quote, it was tough. He's a versatile player. He was going to be a big part of what we were doing. There you go. As a hybrid linebacker safety type, uh, versatility, explosiveness. He looks good, smart, tough, able to pick up things quickly, expecting big things. We'll see. Um... Not pessimistic. I'm not. I'm genuinely. We'll see. 
Vernon Scott with a great coverage on Sternberger's. One note on him, and then Deshaun Amos gets in the mix a little bit. Love delivers uh, to Begleton, but Deshaun Amos with great coverage and a pass breakup. So that's it for the defense. And finally, we got a couple special teams notes here. So general notes, um, we as, as I mentioned, Sean Manega, the special teams coordinator, had a press conference. So um, first of all, uh, Packers special teams coordinator Sean Manega with a great point on the value of practicing teams inside Lambeau Field. Quote, I just think the wins. When you're outside, it's hard to judge those wins. So the bottom line is there are certain conditions in Lambeau that can't be replicated outside of Lambeau. So in my opinion, any opportunity you have to practice inside Lambeau Field, you should probably just go ahead and do that. Um, obviously, you don't want to tear up Lambeau Field just before a game, but in these situations, I don't know why you would play anywhere else. Again, this is an example of the you know the winds that is something that you can't necessarily replicate in just a field out there that has no walls or anything. Um, so that was pretty solid observation. Obviously, Menenga says he basically rebuilding the foundation on special teams. Again, I don't, I don't like that sentence. It makes me nervous. Um, we'll skip ahead. Sean Menenga challenging his guys. Quote: We're not, we were not good enough last year. I think we've established a better culture, and the guys are hungry. Kind of a throwaway thing, but it's good to hear, I guess. And then finally, Menenga on how he wants Packer special teams to play. One of our mottos is penalty-free aggression. It's our goal to be penalty-free, but still play fast and physical. We'll try to establish that each year. Um, as I've said on the podcast, penalty-free aggression reminds me of carb-free pizza. Um, you can do it. It's just not going to be very good. <laughs> uh, finally, Mason Crosby was 4 for 4 on the day, 33, 40, 45, and 50 yards out said it was a pretty breezy day so a solid day for mason crosby and then jk scott who we haven't heard anything from punted 11 times and based on i forget who this was but he calculated it at 47.9 yards average 4.54 is his average hang time i didn't leave it up here but basically those those numbers blow out his averages from last year which pff actually graded him as the second best punter and um individually those would rank really well like second place for both of those metrics if you put them side by side by far that makes him the best punter in all of football 47.9 yards with 454 hang time is a great punt now it's it's an average and it's only 11 punts it's not an entire season but that's kind of a lot um so it's a pretty good sample size and hopefully you can keep that up because jk is another guy that's just got ridiculous potential right that's why you draft a punter because he's he's a very unique football player so so that's it uh that's all i got make sure you subscribe to this channel make sure you um like it comment all that stuff hit the little bell notification so you don't miss any more updates i am starting i guess tomorrow i'm gonna be starting a series for the draft on the top 10 prospects and some of the insights I've learned about them. I'm actually going to start recording today, but I'm planning to have one of those episodes up tomorrow. So please make sure if you're interested in that, that's going to run. The offense is going to run from Sunday through Friday, and then Sunday will st or Saturday will start up with the defense. That's the plan as of now, but we're starting off with quarterbacks. So top 10 quarterbacks and some of those insights tomorrow. Again, hit the little bell notification if you're interested so you don't miss when that one drops. Otherwise, you folks have a great one, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.